Good morning. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Chagas Farm Business Options Webinar event coming to you live from Chagas Mayo. The title of today's webinar is Enterprising Ventures Keeping Mayo Farms Alive. My name is Anne O'Malley, and I am your webinar moderator for today. Working with Chagas has given me a great opportunity to work with farm diversification in the Mayo Options Programme. This webinar has replaced our traditional Chagas Mayo Options Workshops, which are normally held annually each autumn or winter in Mayo. This is the eighth webinar in the Chagas Farm Business Options 2020 series. A recorded version of this webinar and previous webinars will be available on the Chagas web website under Farm Business Options. You are welcome to submit questions via the chat function at the bottom of your screens. Give as much information as possible when submitting a diversification question, and we will ensure that all questions are answered. If they're not answered today, we will ensure that they are answered as soon as possible. Today's webinar is an opportunity for you, the viewer, to connect with an experienced panel of business leaders and champions from Mayo who are in business and growing, and they will take you through their national, international journey and their local journey, most importantly. The panel conversation, questions and answers will investigate challenges, lessons learned and key signposts for new diversification businesses going forward. Our panel today includes Catherine O'Grady Powers, Glenkeen Farm in West Mayo, Joe O'Reilly, Glossary Organic Farm, Hollymount in South Mayo, Patrick Kelly, the Kelly Cattle Company, Clotons Not More in North Mayo, Finnaw Nestor, Falch Ireland Project Officer, Wild Atlantic Way. He's coming to us live from Balcarra in Castlebar. I will give a brief introduction to each farm business. Each of our panel will present their business story or area of expertise to you. I will follow up with a brief conversation or Q&A with each business. The last quarter of the webinar, we will bring our panel together to give you the viewer some parting advice in your diversification journey. So let's get started and go straight to our first speaker. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker, our Agri Tourism Diversification, Glen Keen Farm, Catherine O'Grady Power. So Catherine, I'm just going to give a brief introduction. Catherine, you grew up at the Glen Keen, one of Ireland's largest hill sheep farms located at the stunning Duloc Valley between Lewisburg and Lanan in West Mayo. In 1999, Catherine and Jim, her husband, upon request, returned home from the US to Glen Keen to operate the family farm. And they continued to operate the working sheep farm with Mayo blackface yews and progeny from a successful Texel cross breeding program. In 2004, they started exploring agritourism as an alternative income stream for the farm. This led to the opening of the Agritourism Visitor Centre at Glen Keen in 2014, which coincided with the launch of the Wild Atlantic Way in the same year. The construction of the centre was supported by a leader grant and years of planning, raising of capital and pre-marketing events by Catherine and Jim. Each year they promoted not only their Agritourism Centre, but the region and the island of Ireland to a global audience through international trade events. In 2017, Catherine and Jim were invited to participate in the World Trade uh, or the World Bridge Tourism Project in Shanghai in China, which opened up access to the Chinese market for Glen Keen and the West of Ireland. In 2019, Catherine and, and Glen Keen, the only farm in Ireland, was chosen to participate in the Calling Sheds Project. This project investigates the life of four female sheep farmers in rural locations across Ireland, England, Scotland, and Wales. So Catherine, thank you very much for joining us here this morning. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. And indeed, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation and that wonderful introduction. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar this morning. And I'm going to share a presentation with you on our agritourism business here at Glen Keane. Um, at the Duloc Valley. So um, <clears throat> it's a beautiful morning here. As Anne mentioned, I grew up at Len Keen 
um, and moved away um, to go to third level. And afterwards, I went to the UK and then on to the USA. Um, I have to say, I always had a fondness for coming home. Um, so when we got the call to um, consider moving back to take over and run the farm, it was a joy to my ears. However, my husband is American, so um, it took a bit of convincing for Jim. This is a view here. Uh, we're located at the entrance to the Duloc Valley at the gateway to Connemara, and we have Mwilre here, the tallest mountain in the region of Connacht, as a stunning backdrop. So we're very, very lucky in our beautiful location. And it's also designated by the EU as a special area of conservation, the SAC, which we use um, in all of our marketing material as a unique selling point. Um, we continued to operate the Upland Hill sheep farm with the black faced Jews here. And Jim and I realized around two 2003 that we really had to consider other options and routes to sustainability for the sheep farm. This was after considerable investment of upgrading the fencing and uh, different pieces of infrastructure on site. Now the farm is steeped in history. My ancestors are linked to, this, to the property here right back to the 1600s when they were tenant farmers under the Marquess of Sligo. And this photograph I always use in my presentations. I'm extremely proud of it. My grandfather is seated front row, second from the right. And this of course is when they were tenants. Now, moving on, they were successfully tenant farmers here along with 39 other families up until 1847. And of course, with the challenges faced with the potato famine, um, the failure of the potato crops that resulted in evictions. So like many other families, my own ancestors were evicted and they moved away to a different holding in Boris. But after Ireland became independent and the Free State was formed, my grandparents bought Glenkeen through a land purchase agreement. So we're extremely proud of that. That happened in 1922, they moved here and the farm has remained in the family ever since. It's got stunning scenery. In my opinion, it's the most beautiful setting, I have to say, um, in the west of Ireland. I'm a bit biased here. So um, we're located on the Wild Atlantic Way, which coincided with the opening of our business. Now, in 2004, Jim and I had to pursue a journey of planning clinics with Mayo County Council, engage in archaeology, uh, site surveys and environmental impact sur surveys because we wanted uh, a business to support a rural area and we wanted it to be sympathetic to the beautiful area in which we live. So after 10 years, we were delighted to open the doors of Glenkeen Visitor Centre, a purpose-built visitor centre located on the Wild Atlantic Way. And the launch of the, the Wild Atlantic Way, we used as a launch pad for the opening of our business. And it was great to have this attribute to sell to tour operators. Prior to opening our visitor centre, we actually attended events and trade shows to try and win customers and determine are there customers for this business if we go ahead with this? Because it was a significant risk. The market we were pursuing was the international group tourism market. We um, live in a very rural location. So really the individual traffic, we didn't feel um, would be enough to support the business. So in the visitor center, we have a purpose-built indoor facility that seats up to 100 guests so we can accommodate two coaches at one time and we also have an on-site retail shop where we support local crafters, artists, knitters, potters and jewellery makers to provide unique gifts and giving our customer a very unique retail experience here. For our visitor packages we took what happens on the farm in the present and the past, and we package those activities to create 
visitor experiences for a global audience. And the number one experience is our sheepdog herding display. And that's where the customers meet the, the border collies. Actually, they meet them on arrival at the bus. And they, they hear all about the commands, the training program for the dogs, and um, they see the dogs in action. And we're very fortunate. We have a tremendous local community here that has embraced this business from day one. And we work with local farmers and sheepdog trainers who also help us because we're in the growth stage. So it has been quite busy from 2018 in attracting tourists to Glen Keane. So we want to deliver over under under promise and over deliver exceed customer in, um, expectations so the next item we have is a traditional turf cutting experience we received special permission for that because it's in an sac and this is um undertaken with the traditional sling um guided historical walks we're very very fortunate that the tangible cultural assets that exist here at Len Keen can be experienced by everybody. And they have been protected and maintained over the centuries through generations, right through to this present day. We have a cluster village that escaped the evictions here that we continuously maintain and repair. And we're very thankful to the Heritage Council of Ireland for a grant we received in roof repairs for these buildings last year. Traditional wool spinning and wool dyeing. So all about the processing of the raw wool product into something beautiful. And ultimately the customer can purchase this in the shop. This is provided um, has been in the past by Mary B. Davitt, a cousin of mine and a wonderful local lady and a crafter. And it's also provided by June Burke, who also owns Back to Back. Um, she has her own business as well. We have the pre-famine homesteads, the landscape surrounding the visitor center. It acts as a living museum. It still re retains the fingerprints of the people who lived here before us. So when the visitors come to Glen Keen, they get that very tactile, rural, authentic experience linking their past to the present. Private visits and mountain hikes of the special area of conservation are another activity and immersive traditional Irish music. We have a wonderful neighbour, Johnny Kittrick, who lends his expertise in Shano's dancing and Shano's singing. And every time he's here, he really portrays a very authentic experience, a meet the local experience. And we have wonderful musicians, Brendan Keegan and Joe Ford, and many others whom we work with as well. So we're very fortunate um, to have a wonderful group of people delivering a very premium, authentic tacti tactile experience at Len Keen. Um, and that concludes my introduction to Glen Keen agritourism business. It's still a working sheep farm. The agritourism side is operated on a seasonal basis. And please do connect with us on Twitter and Facebook. We have regular publishing of videos and experiences on the farm. And we're also on Instagram. Thank you. Catherine, thank you very much. Uh, if you could stop uh, sharing your screen now, Catherine. And Catherine, I'd just like to thank you for such a clear um, presentation. I suppose the clarity of your message uh, in relation to the Glen Keane experience is exceptional. Just maybe to follow on with a question to you. I mean, we're in a very difficult year. Uh, how have your, how has your business adapted and what changes have you made? Thank you for that, Anne. Um, it, was, it was quite a shock to us. We had the Boston Police Force in experience in Glen Keane on the 14th of March. Two days later, the, the business that we had generated for the whole season stopped. So we looked at maybe opening for the public and individual visitors, or should we maintain our existing customer base and focus on engaging with tour operators, providing content to them and keeping our customer base that we have invested in so heavily. So that's the route we chose. We are so grateful to the local enterprise office, to Chagas, to Fall to Ireland, to Tourism Ireland. There has been a phenomenal amount of business supports that we have availed of to upskill and deliver virtual experiences. 
Catherine, thank you very much for that. Just in relation to, uh, I, I just went in on, on the web and I just saw your excellent e-commerce site. Can you tell us a little bit about the, your new site? It, it, it's, it's very impressive. Thank you, Anne. The, the site is at www.glenkeenfarm.com. And when you look at our online store here, and I'm sitting in our visitor center as I deliver my presentation, um, it was stocked with beautiful, unique items that local people worked so hard over the winter to produce. So we felt we had to create another channel for sales of that stock. Um, unique gifts and we're supporting local crafters as well. We're actually publishing videos on Meet the Maker. And that website would not have been possible without the Mayo Local Enterprise Office and the supports provided by the government to businesses like ours to diversify, embrace the online world. It hasn't been easy, but we're so delighted to be in this space. And indeed the Westport um, Chamber of Commerce have been a tremendous support as well in supporting businesses like ours that have embraced the online world. Okay, Catherine, thank you very much for your presentation. Catherine, I'll come back to you again at the, at the end of the, the last quarter of the presentation, okay? Thank, thank you. you. So I would like to move on to our next uh, business, and that is the Glossary Organic Farm. Uh, it's a small farm. Uh, we're talking, we're gone from a hill sheep uh, farm in West Mayo to one of the smallest farms in South Mayo. And just to give you a brief introduction, it was written by um, Aoife and Joe. Uh, Glossary is a seven acre organically certified farm in Hollymount. The farm was originally part of Joe's dad's dairy farm. Joe and Aoife and the team grow a large variety of vegetables, fruit and keep poultry. Glossary re-markets includes the Castlebar Farmer Markets, Westport Markets, the Vegetable Box Scheme through their online shop, uh, Super Value Westport and restaurants like Ashford Castle, Castle Café Rua, Sabor Fair and Ginger and Wild the Café at Ballycroy National Park Visitor Centre. Glossary started out with Joe and Aoife and volunteer helpers five years ago. Now they have three full-time employees and two part-time. Our vision as a business is to produce healthy food for people in Mayo, building healthy soils for the future, building a strong local economy and supporting people to build a future for their families in rural Mayo through employment with us. We love what we do and our team is completely passionate about healthy food and sustainable agriculture. We have made a big effort to make our small farm into an environmentally friendly one by planting native hedgerows, wildlife areas and digging ponds. The idea is to encourage a balanced ecosystem within our farm. So I'd just like to thank um, uh, Hort the Glossary Organic Farm and hand over to Joe Riley. So Joe, uh, you can unmute and turn on your, on, uh, start presenting please, yeah. Okay, thanks Anne. Um, yeah, we're on our fifth season here, uh, just finishing up our fifth season here on Glossary Organic Farm. Um, as I said, we started small on one with one polytunnel and quarter of an acre, and we're now using all seven acres of the farm. Uh, it started out with myself and Aoife and some volunteers for the first two years, and we grew on year three. We had two interns from the Organic Growers of Ireland intern scheme, and now we've built that up to have an, a skills team of five, all with previous experience with growing organic veg. Um, healthy soil is at the heart of what we do here. Uh, we believe in healthy soil, healthy crops, healthy people. Um, we go to a lot of conferences. The Biological Farming Conference is one that stands out and we're experts and scientists are connection, connecting healthy soil with human health. And another thing that um, comes to the forefront uh, at these conferences is climate change. And I guess climate change has been a bit of a taboo subject. Um, but now we're seeing uh, what a positive change firms can make uh, in tackling climate change. And I see 
Uh, here I have beside me far uh, the Farmers Journal on the second page of this week's Farmers Journal, Farmers Centre Stage in Tackling Climate Change. So on the farm, we're using minimal till practices. We're in some areas we're using no dig to uh, minimize carbon loss. And we're using agroforestry practices and in our cover, and crop, cover crops uh, where we're resting land, we use deep rooted uh, uh, crops to sequester carbon. Um, I suppose just one thing that has ha um, been important to us is having the diversity in markets. Um, and this year, with all the challenges, uh, the restaurants and cafes, when they shut, we were able to rely on markets uh, and the shops to keep uh, the, the business going. And we were able to up those markets. So I suppose I grew up in a, a beef and dairy farm. And if you had a bad year in beef and a bad year in dairy or a bad year in dairy, one would uh, float the other. So um, I guess uh, we haven't been without our challenges. Starting a, any business, uh, being self-employed, the financial challenges of that uh, is always difficult. We started with some capital to invest in polytunnels in a shed, but the challenge was to afford employees. So we used the volunteers for the first few years and depended on family and friends to come in and help us and built that to where we are now to have an, a strong solid team of five. Um, over the past few years as well, we've looked towards having a better work-life balance and I think we've achieved that. Um, it's been important to us. We've managed to take a holiday this year during the middle of the season um, and we've reduced our hours to what they were at the start, we've we've reduced it to about what we uh, about a forty-hour week, with doing more in the peak season and getting a bit more time off in the winter. Um, one thing that kind of comes back to me again and again when you tell people what to do, or you talk to neighbours, or people have this vision of growing vegetables or organic vegetables as being hard work and drudgery is a lot of uh, a word you hear a lot and it, it doesn't seem like that to us it's and it doesn't seem like that to our team we're enthusiastic we love our work we like working outdoors it's physically healthy it's mentally healthy we're working with nature and we're learning all the time and that's one of the things we enjoy most of all about um working on the farm and growing vegetables for people. So um, that's the introduction. If you have any questions. Um... Yes, Joe, thank you very much for, again, an excellent, clear presentation. And Catherine, or, or, uh, Joe, what I'm really impressed by your, yourself, Aoife, and the team is that you're a young, uh, young farmers. I would classify you as young farmers and a young team with a young family. So it's, it's, and you you have achieved so much with such a small area of ground, and I suppose we're hearing a lot about uh, environmental and social sustainability. And if I read your access to healthy, affordable, and sustainable food, tackling climate change, protect the environment, ensure <coughs> a fair economic return in the supply chain, you are ticking all our boxes for environmental sustainability and social sustainability. So well done. So, Joe, just um, I'm very impressed uh, in relation to young farmers and how, how many other young farmers have the same thinking as yourself. So what is your background, um, yourself and Aoife? Can you give us a little bit into your background and how you got to this point? Uh, well, I guess Aoife's original background is, is commerce. She did a business degree and my original, I was 12 years uh, carpenter. Um, both of us had travelled a bit and we had returned from our travels around 2012 and we ended up doing a course in Mayo Abbey uh, in organic horticulture. So that's where we met and um, I guess I ended up teaching 
for a while in working in the gardens and teaching in the gardens in Mayo Abbey. And I guess in the back of in the background, there was always a surge to, to start our own project. So we, we ended up starting that in 2016 and building from there. Very good. So, and I, so in relation to the your skill set, I mean, you're managing people now, um, you know, uh, did you did you get extra additional training in relation to business management or um, did you do any additional training or was Aoife's background very helpful in that case, her commerce Aoife, background? Aoife's background is very helpful in that case. Uh, I did a start your own business uh, course uh, up in Ballina in the Faw Centre there. Very good. VTAC Center. Um, that was over 10 years ago, probably, or around 10 years ago. Um, it, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of learning as we go. Also, um, we, we've done another course with the OGI, uh, the internships. They, they ran a, a, a course of working with employees or dealing with employees. Um, so that was a very helpful course as well. Yes, and Joe, I know you did the search and farming in Chagas Ball Rope. And I was just wondering, because I know that there was discussion groups involved in that course. Are you involved in an or organic horticultural uh, producer group or a poultry group um, in, in your area? We have, we're, we're, we're involved in, in two discussion groups, mainly set up by growers. It's not led by any... Um, body Jim, Jason Horner of the OGI he would have have set up nationally the small growers group where small growers go around visit each other's farms or we might visit um, a composting um, system um, and uh, or other bigger farms uh, to see what's going on and learn and ask questions um, so we have that nationally and locally, there's a few farmers in Mayo who, who've got together and just and in the evening time, we just every fortnight or three weeks, we'd, we would have gone over to um, visit each other's farms and see what's going on. Um, and the other one, we have a, a consultant, John Hogan, and Knott's run a program through him where he comes onto people's farms and in the after for the, the the morning and the afternoon other people can come on and see what you've gone through with him he might pick up on pests or diseases or different crops that that are doing well and why they're doing well or why they're not doing well okay joe very good so joe i suppose you're a young business you're a young growing business and i suppose it's looking positive in 2021 in relation to uh, organics and or, or, organic payments and I hope they come back and I hope there's payments for small growers in relation to groups as well I mean this is what our policy people should be looking at so Joe I'll just say close for now and I'll come back to you later at the end of the session is that okay Joe okay All thanks right. so um we're just watching time so we're just going to move on to our next speaker again it's a small farm family business and we're moving up to North Mayo to the Kelly Kettle Company, to uh, Pat Kelly or Patrick Kelly and the Kelly family. So I'm just going to give a brief in introduction, Pat, just for a few minutes. And this was written by the pen of, of Pat here. How can a unique and strange looking camping kettle created on a small suckler farm on the shores of Loch Con in Knockmore, County Mayo, go on to become an internationally recognized brand in the outdoors or camping scene? The Kelly Kettle is basically a device for boiling water quickly outdoors for tea or coffee. It works in all weather conditions and does and does not use electricity or gas. Rather, it is fueled by anything that burns. If it burns, it fuels. What was originally a very small part-time business that provided some supplementary income to the Kelly farm and boat hire income, the Kelly Kettle Company is now a standalone business exporting 99.9% .9 of its products to a worldwide audience. Markets include the UK and Europe, North America, Japan, Australia, and Russia. Born and raised on the shores of Loch Con in County Mayo, Patrick and Seamus quickly developed a love of fishing and camping, 
In their school years, the brothers spent every weekend and holiday month fishing and acting as guides on Loch Conn and other waters in the west of Ireland. The Kelly Cattle was, start, was standard camping gear on each and every one of those fishing trips. Postgraduates of UCG and would establish management careers in international marketing and commercial banking. They returned to take, helm of the Kelly, or to take over the Kelly Cattle Company in 2005. Okay, Pat, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Anne. Hi, everyone. And um, um, Joe and uh, Catherine are hard acts to follow. So I'm going to try and keep it uh, fairly short and I give you a bit of a feel, I suppose, where we sort of came from. Um, we're certainly uh, born and bred on a, um, a small suckler farm here in Knockmore in Mayo. Um, we're on the shores of Loch Conn and traditionally um, we have, um, we used to do angling guide as Anne said there on Loch Conn. So from a very early age, my, my, particularly my eldest brother, Seamus and I, the two of us, we would be um, bringing tourists out fishing on the lake from probably the age of 12 onwards. I know it probably wouldn't happen nowadays, but uh, we were a family of seven kids, uh, so it was a small farm, and um, the we used to do the uh, angling tourism, uh, which uh, I know Finn on, uh, is on after me. He's going to speak uh, maybe a bit on that. And um, that time back in the 80s and early 90s, there was a huge amount of angling tourism uh, all across the West in particular. So uh, we used to bring the tourists out fishing, and then we'd, uh, we'd obviously collect a wage off the, at the end of the day and, and hand it up to the parents. That's just the way it operated. So that's the background. It was on a small suckler farm and the fishing used to supplement the, the, the farm income. And as part of that as well, we had this small, fathered a very small business making this very strange looking camping kettle, which was for boiling water. So uh, and that, that's fed on uh, just sticks and, and anything that burns. So in those pictures there, actually, there's um, the, the one top left there, the black and white one, that's, that's taken around 1964, we think. Uh, with a party of Welsh anglers. All those men are passed away now, but the, the, the gentleman sitting at the back, uh, at the back there with the peak cap, centre back with the peak cap with my, my grandfather, Jim. And in the foreground, you can see the Kelly kettle. So they would have been um, standard issue, let's say when you're camping and fishing in the west of Ireland here, that we'd boil up the kettle and that on the lake shore. The next picture across then is, that's my father in the background bending over. He's about to make kettle, uh, boil up a, a kettle there. And in the foreground is the late Jack Charlton. Uh, who, of course, was a big, big anger and used to spend a lot of time up around the Ballina area. Uh, but yeah, that's my father there in the background. There's actually someone there with a stripy black and white jumper, actually, and I think that's either me or my brother Seamus. So that was, we would have been young there again. And, uh, and again, we'd have had angers with us that day. Um, and then the top of the right there is my father, actually. I think like that picture was, uh, was taken back in 1975, I think. So that's around the year I was born. So just, uh, it's just a nice picture. I just like that one. Again, he's brewing up on the shores of the lake. And bottom right there, actually, then is a much more recent picture, and that is actually Bear Grylls, who a lot of the young people love to watch. So, uh, again, he posted that on Instagram there a couple of years back with, you know, I love my Kelly Kettle. So I suppose it just shows where we've kind of come from being a, a, an item that was used specifically when fishing uh, with anglers to a broader appeal, to a much, much broader appeal now. So, um I suppose, so that's the kind of the background. It was used as a supper, it was really a supplementary income. It wasn't a big business. It was small. It was probably pocket money around Christmas time for, um, for the parents uh, to help out, as I say, a family of seven. Um, and then about 15 years ago, my brother Seamus and I, we, uh, we were keen to see where we could maybe take it to as a standalone venture. So I was looking off, my background was commercial banking. So um, I, I kind of had seen a lot of businesses uh, develop and all that sort of stuff. And his background was marketing. So between us, we said we'd have a go at uh, just to see where we could maybe take it. And we, we saw a lot of possibilities with regards to, um, you know, broadening the horizon away from angling uh, in itself. So so uh, we set up the, the, the business, the Kelly Kettle, uh, this particular company. So um, the, uh, I have it here. The business model that we kind of employed was we're, we're a private limited company. OK, uh, obviously, you can be a sole trader. You can be, you know, different partnerships. We're a private limited company. Because we're exporting abroad and because it's a, it's a product with this buyer and all that sort of stuff, we wanted to make sure that, um, that we're obviously, this, you know, we're protected ourselves and our own personal assets are protected. So um, obviously, if you're a private limited company, um, uh, the officers are generally not personally liable for any financial losses, et cetera, if, if a, a, a company's calculation, if, if a calculator risk goes wrong. So we can protect the family assets and that. We've an unusual business model in that none of our we produce nothing here now. Everything is manufactured in China, 
uh, because all the demand nowadays is for steel. Historically, it was aluminium kettles, uh, which were uh, spun in the UK, but actually the, the, the demand worldwide has been for stainless steel product. Uh, they don't want aluminium anymore. And obviously there's not much stainless steel tradition here in Ireland. So uh, we ended up finding a contract manufacturer now a business partner in China, um, and they've been excellent. So we produce in China and we can ship direct to international markets in the US, Japan, Australia, uh, or we bring in here to you to, to knock more. And from here, we distribute out to the customer. So we have a B2C model, which is we sell direct online. So we sell through our website, kellykettle.com or through an Amazon store or an eBay store. Um, that's our best margins. Um, there's no cash flow, issue, cash flow issues because we, we get paid up front. Um, so that's the B2C, they're always, always your best uh, margins. The other option is we also supply to trade. So we, su we sell kettles out to you know, camping stores, um, uh, fishing tackle, hunting outlets all across Europe. So um, that's our business to B2B, the business to business. So we sell to trade. Again, the margin is not as much as our direct sales, but it's still reasonably good. Um, and then the final one there, which I mentioned first actually was the international distribution partners. Uh, because we are producing in China and you have to produce in certain volumes, we can ship direct from China to uh, the North, North America or to Australia or Japan or that kind of thing. So there's the three we have, you know, so it's direct business to business customer through the websites, business to businesses, trade here in Europe, and then direct from the factory in China to Australia, Japan, Russia. Um, so the, I suppose we're very much sort of an online business, but we're still based here on the farm. I mean, I'm like everyone else here. I got a site off the parents, built a house. Um, we lived in Galway. I lived in Galway. I was banking in 10 years in Galway, but we came home. The planning, planning was expiring on the site. So it was either, you know, uh, we had to build or, or lose the planning, weren't going to get it again. So we moved home, uh, built a house. Um, we started off using, um, we started off using my father's uh, hay shed. So as we, as, as we were starting to go from just one or two pallets of products into four, five, six, seven, eight, 10, 12 pallets, pallets of products, I had no place to put them. So I was working out of a small, um, it's probably the box room, I suppose. It's, it's my, my wife's walk-in wardrobe now, but it was big enough to get a small room, a small table and a, a filing cabinet into it. And that's as big as the office was. So I was working from there and we had, we're storing the pallets in my little ordinary, you know, shed at the back of the house and in my father's hay shed. And uh, I suppose uh, that got me thinking of, of the advantages. We're very much sort of an online distribution business now. And I suppose I just wrote down a few things there. You know, we can be located anywhere. You know, we just need internet access and couriers. And there's courier vans, particularly now over the next few weeks, between on post DHL, UPS, DPD, the what they're flying every highway and byway in the country at the minute. So we're, we can be located, or you can be located anywhere if you're sort of a, if you have an online presence. You can have a big online presence. Looks can be deceiving. Very if you have a nice website and you're fairly busy on social media and stuff like that. You can actually put on a big show, but be very small. But we're still very small. We employ four full-time, one part-time person. But yet we be, we have developed, I suppose, a, a good a good footprint over the years. And people actually think we're big, and customers actually write in, "Can we come and see how you, you know how, how you're set up and all that?" Jeez, we don't want to see anyone coming. You know, we're we're, we're so small, we don't want to shatter the illusion. But you can have a big online presence. Looks can be deceiving, and you, you can make a good uh, a good. Uh, show of yourself online if you're clever. Uh, again, low running costs. We used whatever we had available to us. We used the yards, we used the sheds, we used tractors, trailers, you know, use whatever is around you. Uh, because I mean, you have no rent, no rates, you know, um, I, we stay lean. Uh, we use cheap family labor. We use the kids when we were packaging. We were, you, I mean, as kids, we were, we were boating ourselves from the age of 12. Um, there's nothing wrong with using the kids and keeping them busy. Um, so. I would use everything that's available. You know, we use the tractor. We use the front end loader of the tractor uh, to actually to move pallets around. We didn't have a forklift or anything like that. So, and the ground was rough sometimes. So we use the front end loader of the tractor to unload pallets from containers for, or from, from, from trucks for, for several years. You know, we used the quad as we got a bit bigger and I was trying to move uh, boxes around between my brother's shed and my shed and my father's shed. We used the quad and a bit of trailer. We just, well, anything that is available to you use. Uh, again, again, the quality of life, uh, just uh, another advantage because it was flexible hours. Um, you can come and go as you like or get involved in football or collect kids or put on the dinner or whatever it is. 
Um, and the beauty of in an online business is you can have orders actually while you're sleeping. So it kind of ticks away. Can't, if you have a product that you can sell online, it's great because the orders can come in while you're sleeping. So that's always a good thing. In our case, we've looked abroad very much so. Um, we, are, we export 99.9% .9 of our product. We sell little or nothing in Ireland. There's not much of a camping tradition here. There is the fishing tradition, but most of them already have kettles. So we look abroad. Mm -hmm. And um, in that regard, the biggest, historically, the biggest markets have been the UK, Europe, and now obviously, you know, the US and all of that is, is growing quite well. And that'd be where we'd be looking to uh, going forward. And then uh, obviously, again, as an online business, uh, primarily a lot, and we're, we're leaning more towards online than selling even to trade. We're leaning more and more towards the online is good margins. And as I mentioned okay. before. Okay, one minute, Pat. Yep, yeah, thank you. That's okay. it. And then, so then uh, the next thing was uh, organic growth. It's everything that happens. One, we haven't a huge product range. It's only one product at a time. Um, and we have, we're planning launching a series of new products now in uh, May, which be very interesting and they all complement exactly what were the, the existing product range so it's just adding to what we have and then uh just to give you an idea i just mentioned there the uk was our biggest market and the uh the final slide here shows a quick uh, snapshot of where the traffic comes from um from uh and we i suppose what we're looking at now is brexit so that, that's that's a heat map of where our online traffic comes from and as you can see the dark blue there is the UK. So that's where most of our business comes from at the minute, the online business. And of course, we've, with Brexit, there's new challenges. Will there be inside or outside the VATnet? Will there be like Norway or, Sw or Switzerland? Will there be import duties? Are there going to be shipping delays? Do we need to warehouse stock in the UK or do we need to register a UK company? All that sort of stuff. So, so we've had a good run of it, um, but there's obviously huge hurdles coming down the line. So the next, you know, next couple of months are going to be interesting. Pat, uh, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. And Pat, I feel that your product uh, and your business uh, caught my attention and uh, you've attended an options course in Balna and you, 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 you raffled uh, a Kelly Kettle, so it was just a lovely little uh, offer that you made at the time. And I remember it particularly well. I just have one question came in from a viewer and you, you, you how do you build a business beyond one product to spread the risk and grow the business? And I suppose you're doing that now, aren't you? Yeah, slowly, uh, one, just one at a time. I mean, we're, we're lucky in that the kettle is very, it's, it's very unique. So if you have a very unique product, it, it's something you can talk about. Um, so, you know, we saw from the first clips there, that if anyone hadn't seen it before, the fire of the middle, it's, it's actually very weird. It's, it's weird, it's quirky, but it works. And it, it is slow, one at a time. Uh, I mean, uh, one of the simplest things we did there recently, a couple of years back was we were boiling water for years, but we never supplied cups. You know, so people are boiling the water, then they're putting it into a cup, one of their own cups. Well, sure, why can't we make a bloody cup? So if we boil the water, let them put them into one of our cups because they're otherwise they're going off buying them elsewhere. And then we develop plates and we develop little cook sets. It's all just add-ons. And then the range of products like that that we're looking at doing now in May are all complementary because it's all outdoor folk we're selling to. So it's sleeping bags, it's tents, it's tarps, it's, you know, so it's, it's we're not trying to reinvent the wheel at all, but we're trying to get good quality products at a reasonable price, brand it with good service. So it's slow and steady, slow and steady, to be honest. Okay, Pat, thank you very much. Pat, I'll come back to you at the end of the webinar on the last session, okay? We're moving Thanks, on to our next speaker, and our next speaker is uh, Fennon Nestor from uh, Folja, Ireland. And I'll just give a brief introduction to Fennon. Fennon is Project Officer for Mayo, for Mayo on Folja, Ireland's Wild Atlantic Way team. Finon is from Balcarra village near Castlebar, where he grew up in tourism. His family operate a number of businesses, including the Carvin Park, South Catering, and a successful, innovative agritourism business. Finon has worked with Fulge Ireland for close to 15 years across a number of teams and projects, including domestic marketing, product development, and in community engagement on the Gathering Ireland 2013. So Finon will focus on the Wild Atlantic Way marketing story, infrastructure developments, and the benefits to rural tourism and agritourism, and its role, role in raising the profile of the county as a tourism destination. He will also discuss the up-to-date stats for Mayo over the last five to six years, and trends and outlooks for Mayo and holiday de as a holiday destination going forward post-pandemic. So Fiona, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much. So um, thank you. Good morning. Thanks, Anne, for inviting me to speak this morning. Hello, everybody. Um, so as many of you already know, 
Fáilte Ireland is the national development authority for uh, tourism, much like Chagask uh, it would be for the agricultural sector. Um, Fáilte Ireland is that for tourism. So it's our job to help support and promote tourism in Ireland. And we do that in a number of different ways. So we work very closely with the tourism industry, so with attractions and activity providers and accommodation providers. We provide mentoring and training and access to international markets, research and strategic planning, uh, lots of good stuff. Uh, we also are involved in marketing and promotion. So uh, domestically, you'll be familiar with the Discover Ireland campaign. So we do a lot of kind of traditional marketing in Ireland, encouraging people around the country to take holidays in Ireland, staycations. Uh, but we also bring media into the country from overseas in the hope that they'll return and write about their great experiences here in their publications. And we bring tour operators in as well on familiarization trips uh, in the hope that they'll go back and program Ireland as a new destination uh, for their visitors. And then finally, we're involved in investing in tourism infrastructure. So for those of you who are on the call this morning from Mayo, um, we, have, uh, we have a big investment in Cage Fields at the moment, uh, one million euro investment with the OPW there to overhaul their visitor experience. So totally new interpretive experience there will be opening from March. It's very exciting. Uh, we've over two million euro invested in the Western Way with the National Park Service. So um, it, that's developing the Western Way as an off-road walking and cycling trail. Um, and that's going to be connecting, essentially connecting Newport and the Great Western Greenway all the way to the North Mayo coast. That's um, a huge development and work will be beginning on the ground next year. And we have a million euro invested with the local authority in Bell Mullet as part of the Destination Town Initiative. So that's kind of looking at, at public ground stuff, uh, particularly around the key area. But, but these aren't the only capital projects and exciting projects happening around the county right now. There are loads of agencies and public bodies involved in investing in tourism in Mayo right now. Some other big projects to be aware of. Um, and I, I, the reason I'm mentioning these is it's always good to know what are the big project projects happening around the county because it might give you some ideas as to where your business could focus in the coming years. So you'll have seen a recent announcement about a 5 million euro extension to the Great Western Greenway. So that's going to add another 52 kilometers to that route, which is huge. Um, there's a big investment going into Ballantubber Abbey as well uh, with the local authority uh, to develop a heritage center there. Another big investment into the Atlantic Center um, or Unadervala, as many of you would know it up on Black Sod. Uh, there are significant developments up around Moore Hall and Loch Carra. So some of you I'm sure have been there recently um, and they've done a lot of work around the wall garden, but they have a very exciting master plan for that whole um, estate. Uh, Westport House have big plans. They're investing significantly in developing not just a story around their Browns, but the story around Grace O'Malley, Grania Whale uh, as well. Um, we have a big plan for Keem Bay. Uh, there are early plans uh, progressing now for a planetarium and observatory in the National Park. So these are all kind of public body investments that are live at the moment in Mayo. But there's other businesses coming through, new experiences, new attractions opening. Even in the last six months, we have a beautiful new museum in North Mayo. The Ballinglin Museum of Contemporary Art has opened. Incredible experience that just opened during the summer. The Old Irish Goat Centre and Sanctuary has opened in Mulrani. And the Irish Market Whiskey Experience has opened in Ackle. Um, and that's on top of all the other great experiences we have in Mayo from Glenkeen Farm. You heard from Catherine earlier. Lost Valley, Lockmas Distillery, Ackle Sea Salt, um, and then the bigger attractions like Foxwood Woolen Mills and the National Museum of Ireland Country Life. So even in the face of the challenges um, that are there at the moment, it's still a very exciting time to be involved in tourism uh, in Mayo. Now, tourism, as you know, you all know, is hugely important in this country. It employs quarter of a million people. Uh, and in fact, it employs more people than agriculture and construction and education combined. Um, and I might ask just to change the slide there a little bit. That's okay. Uh, just if you could just go back one, just go back two slides. Uh, one more. Great. Um, so, um, so nowhere is, um, and nowhere is in tourism more important than right here in Mayo. So Mayo has one of the highest proportions of businesses operating tourism uh, in this country, um, as you can see there. So Mayo, Donegal and Kerry um, have the highest proportions of businesses operating in tourism in the country, which is so, so we really do feel the impact of growth or decline in tourism uh, here. Uh, last year in Ireland, it was a record breaking year uh, for tourism. We had almost 10 million visitors into the country. Um, the main markets for us, as many of you are aware, is Germany, uh, France, uh, the US and the, uh, the UK. Um, now, if you could just change slides again, if you don't mind, just one, keep going, one more. And 
yes, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, so the Wild Atlantic Way has been a huge success uh, for us in raising the profile of the West Coast and helping bring some of those international visitors to the Western counties. There's about 4 million visitors to the Wild Atlantic Way last year. Uh, and in Mayo specifically, uh, we had about 330,000 international visitors. So if you look at the number of international visitors coming to Mayo, versus the total number of international visitors come to the Wild Atlantic Way, we get about uh, one in 10 or less, less than one in 10, in fact. Um, and there is a reason for that. If you could just change the slide. Uh, so there is a traditional tourist trail that the majority of visitors into this country follow. They tend to come in through Dublin Airport. Uh, they travel uh, across the country to Galway, do a day trip to Connemara, and then they head south because they want to see the Burren and the Cliffs of Moher and the Ring of Kerry and Blarney Castle, etc. And it's very difficult to change these behaviours because, you know, for a lot of people, these are bucket list trips and they've been reading about the Cliffs of Moher and Blarney Castle in Condé Nast and National Geographic and, and whatever for years. So these are the places that they want to go to. So it can be difficult uh, to kind of change your behaviour. But, you know, we're doing a lot in that area, trying to encourage uh, people to travel north of Galway on the, uh, on the Wild Atlantic Way. Um, now, I should say, even though last year was a record-breaking year, um, it is obviously important to recognize that it's been a really difficult year for everybody in tourism this year. Uh, and while some parts of the country have experienced, you know, a moderate uptake in, in domestic trips, uh, a lot of businesses are facing, you know, huge losses uh, due to prolonged closure. But the summer in Mayo was, in fact, quite good. So Mayo had one of the highest levels of hotel occupancy in the country during July and August. Uh, and some businesses, in fact, reported there they had the busiest summers ever during July and August. There was even, you know, serious congestion issues in areas like Ackle. They even closed, closed the roads out to Keen Bay at one stage due to safety concerns. Um, but since the most recent level five restrictions, consumer sentiment has taken a bit of a hit again. And many of the positive trends we had seen uh, in the late summer have, uh, have reversed. So the, the short term outlook is, is somewhat bleak, unfortunately. If you can just slip, skip uh, slide one more forward um, but there is light at the end of the tunnel you know we're very encouraging news about uh, various vaccines and their efficacy coming through uh, which will be available in uh, 2021 uh, so international business will return it may never get back to 2019 levels and it may take a number of years to get even close to that but there is demand domestically we saw that over the summer there is intent to travel when the restrictions lift and in the short term businesses really need to focus on attracting that lucrative uh, domestic business but obviously keeping an eye on international markets as well, because that's really where the long-term sustainability of the industry uh, is. Um, so that is a quick whistle-stop tour of tourism and what's happening at the moment. Much of it won't come as a huge surprise to many of you, but there you are. Okay, Fionn, thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Just one question there in relation to self-catering. Um, we probably have a lot of self-catering on farms, uh, accommodation, which would be very suitable for a lot of farm families. Yeah. What um, standards or what requirements or what help does, does Fall to Ireland give uh, prospective uh, startup businesses when you're talking about accommodation and self-catering? Well, self-catering properties can actually apply for a thing called the welcome standard through Fall to Ireland. And it's not a very onerous process and it's not very costly. Uh, what it involves is a self-assessment um, and then there's, a, there's an on-site visit. There is an annual fee, but it's, it's minimal and it depends on how many properties you, you have. But I think it starts maybe at maybe 200 euro for your initial fee and then it drops after that on an annual basis. Um, so once approved, then a welcome standard property um, will get the approved signage to display on your website or display at your property. Um, and then access to marketing opportunities um, and business supports and you'll be listed on discoverireland.ie for example so if anybody out there is interested in opening a self-catering property and getting approved by Fault Ireland it's all on faultyireland.ie um, so uh, just take, take a look at that but again like I said it's not it's not very onerous we've done a lot to make the process easier uh, for people over the last number of years. Okay, thanks for on for that. So I'd like to welcome back um, all our panelists. Um, if you could all uh, turn on your videos. And uh, we just have a roundup session. And I suppose what we'd like to do maybe in the last, uh, we have around uh, five or six minutes. I just like some parting advice for our viewers. Now I know this question's coming in and I'll get to them again and I, we'll come back to them. And I, 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 you can all see the, the questions as well. But I suppose um, if I start there with you, Catherine, Catherine, you're quite experienced uh, 
But I noticed there you you started looking at your business in 2004. You didn't start up till 2014. Have you got any two good pieces of parting advice for our viewers based on your experience? Thank you, Anne. Um, yes, um, we placed significant importance on research and finding out what type of customer would be suitable for our business. And in some instances, you can get lost in the passion of pursuing an idea especially when it's on the home farm. Um, but I think it's so important to talk to other like-wise um, businesses that are already established so we can really learn from their experiences and their knowledge and their advice. And um, we pursued a lot of that research and also um, through Fall to Ireland trade workshops and how to deal and communicate and sell to tour operators as well. So pre preparation is key. Um, the other piece of advice in our instance, I would say the work-life balance is so important. You're living on the farm, you're creating another business because you're already farming um, and it can be quite stressful at times. So it's really important to take a step back um, and take time for the family as well um, and just to regenerate because burnout is, is, um, is one element that can happen as well. So mind oneself. Yes, Catherine, thank you very much. And I'd like on behalf of Chagas to thank Glenkeen Farm for all your support to Chagas Options over the last 10 years. So Joe, um, I'd just like to move on to you. What uh, have you any two, you're a young farmer, you're a young business. Have you got two pieces of parting advice, Joe, for uh, our viewers? Yeah, and um, I think uh, Patrick also mentioned it, uh, the word organic and grow, not growing or just growing organic, but growing the business organically as in not taking on too much uh, in one year. And I think we would say in that we did that uh, on year two when an opportunity to cook came up. And uh, so we had to take a risk and we did grow the business a huge amount of that year. And it did create a lot of pressure and stress and all that, that comes with it. So just when you are taking on um, a, a, a lot in one year just be beware of that and try but try and grow it slowly rather than take on too much if possible and um, the other thing that's been key to us uh over the past few years is that, is that having that network of growers local growers as as vegetable growers just for if if we have a problem um, we we're on whatsapp groups we can take a picture of a plant that's not doing well and then and it, it might be weather conditions and everyone might have that same problem and it's just um it's just great to have that network uh, uh to hand yeah so a group discussion a group support it's, it's, it's excellent it, it does work yeah so just on behalf of chagas i'd like to thank you for your support to chagas options for the last 10 years and, and again today thank you very much pat what two pieces of parting advice would you give to viewers based on your, I suppose you've international experience and again, you're a, an experienced uh, business person and you've given a lot of business advice there on your slides. Okay, Pat? Yeah, it's funny because it's, it's actually no different to being, you know, the local producer like Joe or that. It's the same thing I wrote down here, you know, surround yourself with good people and ask questions, you know, so uh, I mean... You know, how do you how do you import product? How do you get product out of China? How do you get it from China to the US? You know, yeah, and all that sort of stuff. And you think it's a huge job. And then all of a sudden you, you pick up the phone to the right person and say, Jesus, uh, this is wrecking my head here for the last six months. I'm terrified. And they say, Jesus, that's no problem at all. Leave that to me. Where do you want to go? And, they, and, and they'll do it. So, I mean, if you talk to the right people and you bounce ideas off each other, there's no problem. So I would ask loads and loads of questions. People are always willing to help out. And, and I'll say when I said surround yourself with good people, I also mean in that on, on, on the accountancy front, you need a good accountant. And I don't mean an accountant who will just return your figures for you because a leave and search student could do that. I want an accountant that you can throw ideas off and ask you questions. Did you ever try this? Did you ever try that? Can we consider this? That's just a challenge. And then, and obviously then even intellectual property rights, a solicitor, if you're looking to, you know, trademarks or that sort of stuff, you need to talk to a proper IP rights solicitor, not your local GP, because that's what they are, you know. Uh, and the other thing then was, and a bit like um, Catherine touched on it, is you have to enjoy what you do. If you don't enjoy what you do, get the hell out of it, because you're not going to make a success of it. You know, so you need that work-life balance, and uh, you need to get a kick out of it most days, not every day. 
some days are worse than others, but you need to really enjoy it. Excellent, Pat. Thank you very much for that, that piece of advice. And again, Pat, I'd like to thank you for your support to Chagas with options and again for your support today. Thank you very much to the Kelly Cattle Company. And Finon, just quickly, have you any party piece of advice for your from your area of expertise in Fulch, Ireland? Um, so I, I do. If, if there are people out there looking to develop a new visitor experience, um, what I would recommend is you go and see other similar experiences. So learn from those who are doing it well elsewhere. You learn a huge amount from other people. Uh, you learn what to do and maybe what not to do. The other thing I'd say is, uh, and much like what Patrick had said, you know, you don't have to invest heavily in, heavily in capital from the outset. You know, use what you have, stay lean. Um, and trial your experience. All of our research tells us that the most important stuff in any visitor experience, the most important thing, hands down, is the guided personal experience. That's what really matters. So that's the thing you need to get right. So start with that, uh, test the experience, and if it's working, then you can look at scaling up in time. Okay, thank you very much, Finon. And again, thanks to Fall Ireland for all your support to Chagas for the options in the last 10 years and again today. So this concludes our uh, webinar for today. Just before I go, obviously, I would like to thank all my panel. I would like to thank the viewers. And just to ensure that any questions that have come in that haven't been answered, I will get back to and we'll answer them uh, as soon as possible. I'd just like to let you know of upcoming webinars. Uh, we have our poultry advisor, Rebecca Tierney, will have a webinar tomorrow at 12 o'clock. So that might be of interest to some of you. Next week, we'll have our Chagas Farm Business webinar coming from Leitrim. Uh, last week, we had uh, Bernard Dorley coming from uh, Leash, uh, the, the Midlands. And in on the uh, 15th of December, we have Rachel Taylor coming from Kildare. So they'll be all farm diversification businesses coming from different parts of the country. And we also have uh, a lady on the 22nd of December, Aoife O'Reardon, coming from Cork. So tune in uh, this time um, uh, at, at 11 o'clock for upcoming webinars. My last but not least, I'd like to thank Barry Caldlin, our technical host for today, uh, for helping us out uh, with all the technical uh, background in relation to the webinar. So from, from all of us here in Chagas Mayo, from all our businesses, from uh, Glen Keane Farm, Glossary Organic Farm, from the Kelly Cattle Company, from Falcher Ireland, and from Anne in Chagas, goodbye and keep safe. Thank you.